Jim, welcome back to Real Vision. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you here, this time on the Real Vision crypto side. Uh, Jim, you've been in this space uh, literally for decades. People who are on the macro side, on the capital market side, will already know who you are and what you do. But for folks on the crypto side who may not be familiar, tell us a little bit about your work. Yeah, so I am a, a macro uh, strategist, maybe even an economist, although I don't consider myself one, but I do a lot of that kind of work. And I've been operating in this space since the 1990s. So I've been producing research for our institutional client base in economics, in strategy, a little bit in politics, some technical analysis, trying to give insight and edges on where the big picture is going in stocks, in bonds, in currencies, um, in Federal Reserve policy, uh, and the like. So I've been doing, like I said, I've been doing this since the 90s, uh, and uh, I've been all over the lot with terms of where I go, because I run my own firm, I'm allowed that flexibility to kind of go where I think the story is, whereas Wall Street tends to take strategists like me and silo you into, you are the emerging market strategist, or you are the developed market economist, and you right. can't really go outside of that silo. I go outside those silos all the time. Yeah. And that actually lends itself uh, directly to the next question, which is, you know, you and I have both been doing this for a long time. We've both been watching markets for a long time. There are a lot of people who just don't get the digital asset space. I mean, smart people on the capital market side who write books about how markets function, either they are overtly hostile to it or more often say things like, well, I just don't get it yet. Maybe this is going to go away tomorrow. I'm not really that interested. What was it that led to your key insights uh, to realize that this space was something that was important? So I started trading in this space uh, back in 2017. I opened up a GDAX account, which is now Coinbase, Coinbase Pro. And I started playing around with Bitcoin and a little bit of Ethereum. And to be honest with you, back in that time, I I found it interesting, but I didn't really see uh, a use case for it. I thought I was betting on magic beans going up and down and was just having some fun doing it. But as I kept uh, pace with the space during uh, you know, the, the crypto winter of 2018 and 2019, I saw the rise of DeFi come. And then when De DeFi summer hit last year, it started to become into focus to me Here's the use case for all of this. This is a parallel financial system that is being built. It is version 1.0 of that new system. It is still the Wild West. And there was another rug pull this morning, uh, is, you know, as we talk uh, right now. And there's going to be more innovation and there's going to be more changes in this space. But if you can look past the immediate issues in the space, gas fees and Ethereum, for example, down the road, once ETH2 comes, once a lot of these other protocols have gone through a couple of upgrades as well, too, you could see where we're going with this. And it is a whole new financial system that is being built right now. Yeah, I should probably say we're recording here on Monday, May 17th, set to air. Sorry for interrupting your video, but I have an important message to share. At Real Vision, we pride ourselves on providing the very best in-depth expert analysis available to help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy. So if you like what you see on Real Vision's YouTube channel, that is just the tip of an iceberg. You should come over to realvision.com and see how we are not leaving any stone unturned from publishing more in-depth videos, live discussions, written reports, and our latest feature, The Exchange, where you get a chance to engage with experts and fellow subscribers and learn from everyone's experience. It is an experience which you live and you learn from. So if you go to the link in the description or go to realvision.com, it costs you just $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it. And it is a whole new financial system that is being built right now. Yeah, I should probably say we're recording here on Monday, May 17th, set to air on Friday, uh, May 21st. So there's been some volatility, obviously, over the weekend uh, today. Uh, talk a little bit about that, how you think about it in the context of the bigger picture. 
Yeah, well, I mean, the, the immediate volatility over the weekend is uh, always from the center of the volatility universe, otherwise known as Elon Musk, uh, and his tweets over the weekend about uh, Bitcoin and energy usage <clears throat> and Dogecoin, and it's got everybody all worked up uh, as well, too. So, But as far as volatility goes in general, this is part of an emerging technology. Those in the traditional um, uh, financial space should be comfortable with this idea. You invest in pharma startups, pharma startups with zero revenue, but a bunch of guys with lab coats and high degrees that you're betting will do something special like a Moderna did with the uh, vaccine. So, and those types of companies boom and bust all the time. Look at some of the technology companies that have become old staples. Apple. Apple has had seven corrections of at least 80% in its history. Seven. In fact, between 1983 and 2003, for 20 years, the stock price did nothing. It went sideways for, for 20 years. Amazon. Amazon had a 93% correction. It went from $100 in 1999 to $6 in 2001. So you should understand that when you get these new technologies, you get this kind of incredible volatility. It's par for the course because everything is so uncertain about it. And also what happens too is you need to separate the protocol from the, um, from the specific, or I'm sorry, the concept from the protocol. And what do I mean by that? DeFi is going, I think is gonna be a new parallel financial system and it's gonna replace the old financial system. Okay, great. So I should go buy the Uniswap token. Well, maybe, maybe that is going to be the winner, or maybe it's not going to be the winner. We'll have to return. Remember, we'll have to see. The example I've used is, let's say it's 1998, and you come to the conclusion e-commerce is going to be the biggest thing ever. And I think I'm going to play on pet supplies, and I'm going to buy pets.com. Mm -hmm. Went to zero. You lost 100% of your money. But fast forward 20 years later, and we have Chewy, and it's been an enormous success. So when you look at the space, I could say DeFi is going to be a winner, but am I investing in pets or am I investing in Chewy? That's going to be the trick, I think, when it comes to people deciding where they want to put their money and how they want to position themselves in this space. Yeah. You know, there's so many important points that you've touched on there. First, this nature of volatility in new technology, I think, is such an important Point, especially from someone uh, who has this voice, who has understood and seen and witnessed these cycles before. When you talk about the volatility in Amazon, in Apple, it gives a sense uh, of just a bit of context for how volatility can exist uh, in the context of a larger trend. Sure. And you've even seen it in recent months or so. You know, Goldman Sachs has a non profitable technology index. Uh, and that has been extraordinarily volatile, you know, headed up by things like Plug Power and Neo, as far as two, two of the bigger players in that, in that space. But non-profitable tech tends to become profitable tech, you know, and then they tend to settle out. The other thing you need to understand about new spaces too, and it gets to like venture capital. A lot of these will go out of business as well too. You know, in venture capital, uh, Roger McNamee of Elevation Partners many years ago spoke the truth once I was watching him on CNBC and they asked him, uh, how do you pick your companies that you invest in? And he said, uh, I buy them all. 80% of them go to zero, but the few that wind up making it go up 100x or 500x and they make up for all the losses. I'm kind of paraphrasing what he said. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's kind of the same way when it, this space is well, too. The space itself, I think, will live will live on. Most of these protocols will go out of business, but the few that don't will go up tremendously and become transforming transformational. Yeah. So talk a little bit about how you think about that transformation, the mechanics of how you see it happening. You know, when you mentioned Pets.com, I remember uh, in those days in the late 90s when I was one of the young kids uh, on Wall Street myself watching Pets.com, hearing about Pets.com. How do you understand where you are in the cycle? How do you think about the potential future trajectory? How do you think about risk? And how do you think about investing in the space? Well, that's a that's a that's a tough one. I mean, where we are in the cycle, I think, is very early. 
in early days right now. Uh, and what we're looking for, and this is the criticism you, the criticisms you get in terms of the where we are in the cycle tend to fall into two spaces. The first one is people say, what's the use case uh, for um, uh, DeFi? What, when can I take out a DeFi loan? And my answer is, well, the day you can take out a DeFi loan, you know, most of the gains will have already been had. Markets are supposed to be forward looking and they're supposed to be anticipating it. But right now, what I think the use case in, in DeFi is stress testing the system. You know, Uniswap has got what, 2 million transactions a day that it's running through its system right now. And it will continue to grow on that to show that when it wants to port into being a, a protocol that can be used by the traditional economy, that it's ready for prime time, that it's been battle tested uh, as well too. Risk is a difficult one because the protocols change so fast. Look, I, I'm not a tech guy. I can't keep up with it. And all the tech guys that I watch and respect, they can't keep up with it either uh, as well. So when it comes to risk, I think you need to set, like I said, I'm going to repeat myself. There's the protocol. I mean, there's the concept of DeFi and the whole idea. And I think that's here to stay. The protocols are going to be difficult to try and discern which ones are going to make it and which ones are not. That's why things like DeFi Pulse uh, and TCAP, which is fairly new right now, are coming into play because it gives people a way to say, I'll just buy everything and, ex and expect some of them to go away, a few of them to become huge winners. And I think that that's also why you tend to get a lot of the craziness in this space as well, too, because no one knows what's going to win. So when new things pop up, whether it's Safe Moon or the doggy coins, I got to buy everything because I'm just not sure where, what's going to win or what's not going to win. And that's where you get all the insanity that you seem to see almost on a weekly basis. Yeah. So for folks who have been uh, on the digital asset side, we have people who come to us, for example, uh, from the computer science perspective. Tell us a little bit about how you think uh, about markets and the, what you've already seen in the traditional capital markets asset investment space and how you see these systems becoming integrated. Because right now, as we're having this conversation in May of 2021, they're just totally different domains, right? There's the capital markets over here, there's the digital asset markets over there, and never the twin shall meet, uh, at least today. How do you see that beginning to come together? How do you see these becoming closer and ultimately potentially, potentially at least, beginning to integrate in a way where we can see some of these things like DeFi taking on some of the roles that the traditional financial system, traditional lenders function in uh, in May of 2021? Well, I think that they are starting to integrate in that more and more people in the crypto space are recognizing that traditional macro indicators impact them. The views on inflation, interest rates, whether or not the stock market's going up or down, the, the strength of the economy is more and more having an impact in that space. It's not completely independent. So it's starting to trade off of some of those macros. But how does it port in? Let's remember how technology typically works. A new technology does, well, a new technology does more than just overlayer on an existing business uh, model. You know, that's the big mistake I think a lot of traditional people make. Oh, here's a new technology. Oh, good. We'll take our business model and we'll add a bunch of computers to it with some software. And therefore, we've made it marginally more efficient. No, new technology usually means a complete rewrite of the whole business model from the ground up and right. makes your business model a little bit obsolete along the way. So, I look at when they try to write it from the ground up, a lot of the lending and borrowing protocols, let's use those, the compounds and the Aves of the world, <clears throat> just as two examples, that they will eventually become something where it's a lot cheaper, it's a lot faster, it's a lot more efficient than the traditional deposit taking and lending that a bank does. And more and more people will start to think of them as an alternative to a bank. Now, before we get there, the UX experience has got to get a lot better, a lot better. You know, as I, I've joked to some of people in the space, you know, my my 80 year old mother 
when are you going to have a user experience that she could consider taking her money out of a CD in a bank and put it into a protocol? Maybe never, uh, but you got to kind of start thinking about it in those terms because this space is occupied by, and I'll use a, a triggering term, the 1% of technology enabled people, not wealth, but technology enabled people. How do you bring this space to the other 99% of lesser technology able people? I've met a lot of traditional people that have asked me about this space. And they said, yeah, this sounds interesting. I can go onto a lending uh, protocol and I can stake some coins and I can get some 12, 14% interest rate on stable coins. I could go to Lexus, Nexus Mutual. I could FDI type of insurance and buy that against it and get an all in protected uh, interest rate of something like six, 7% versus zero in the bank, yes. And then when you tell them go and put your money into a MetaMask or a Dharma and start doing this, they come back to me a week later and go, I can't get it, it's too hard, it's too much. I don't have the technical skills to do that. So they definitely have to start working on the user experience right. in order to bring it to the masses. That will come. That will come over time. I don't think the system is quite ready yet, uh, but um, I, you know, again, look down the road and you can see that coming. Yeah. So let's take it from the other side, from the opposite perspective. So for someone uh, like you who's had uh, decades of experience in traditional capital markets, how do you explain what Ave and Uniswap are? How do you explain the nature of that experience? Walk us through what that was like for you and for people who may not have done it yet, what it might be like for them. Yeah, so <clears throat> what, I, what I've explained to them is that the, these are whole new protocols written from the ground up that are that are challenging some of the existing protocols. Let's take Uniswap with the automatic market maker, X, Y, K, you know, the, the curve that they that they they put the liquidity pools on. Break, break that all is, down for people who don't understand it, who haven't yet seen it, who haven't yet had the opportunity to participate. So in a traditional space like the New York Stock Exchange, you'll have an order book with bids and offers. And the bids and offers are constantly coming in. You've probably seen it maybe on some um, uh, websites or on something else where you got the red and the blue, uh, red and green lines of the bids and the offers that come back and forth. In a protocol, an automatic market maker like a, a Uniswap, they have a liquidity pool, and in the liquidity pool, it's got a pairs in in trading, maybe a stable coin against ETH or so to use an example. And as you in as you trade with it, you're either adding coins into the pool. I'm going to add stable coins into the pool, and I'm going to take ETH out of the pool. And the pool keeps rebalancing itself so that the price levels are 50-50 along the way. And and you, me, you, everybody else, we could add liquidity into the pool and then get paid because there's a 0.3% transaction fee and get paid for staking our coins into the pool. Or we can use an automatic market maker as a trading venue. It's a whole new way of doing trading. It is much more flexible and um, uh and eventually, I think it's going to be a much more cost-effective way of doing trading. Maybe it is now, or maybe it's not now, but I think it will eventually go that way, especially when you consider the thousands of different pools that you can run uh, at the same time. So a Virtu Financial or you know one of these big market-making kind of firms has got to look at this and say, is this our disruption? A New York Stock Exchange has to look at this and say, is this our type of disruption? On the Aves and the compounds of the world, these are lending and borrowing protocols where you can put your coins, stake your coins in, and get an interest rate from the people that borrow those coins on the other side as well, too. So what they've become is a digital bank or a, a, a bank is what they've essentially have set themselves up to. And I've thrown out the provocative line to some of my friends that we know in 2021, the largest taxi company in the world, Uber, doesn't own any taxis. And the largest hotelier in the world, Airbnb, doesn't own any hotel rooms. You could be looking at, when you look at some of these protocols, that the largest bank in the world somewhere down the road won't be handing out loans. They'll just be a protocol 
where the where the the, the lenders and the borrowers meet together all run by a smart contract and start thinking about these types of changes as well. Final thought I'd give you. I've also kind of told people in this space, this is all new and this is completely different. Don't think that you can take a three-day seminar on what is DeFi, what is cryptocurrencies, uh, and uh, you'll be ready for you'll be ready to go after that point. Just like in the traditional world, somebody can't come up to you and say, I'm the 19-year-old undergrad, and I just took a three-day course in what is finance, so here's my resume, Goldman Sachs. I would like a job with you. No, we want you to have a full four-year degree and maybe even a graduate degree or an MBA before we'll consider hiring you. It might take as much work as getting that MBA to understand this space. So get started now because you might need to invest a couple of years slowly over time to learn this space. Don't think you're gonna wait for it to arrive and then take that three-day course and I'll be ready to go with this. Yeah, this is so interesting to me, Jim. Uh, and you're one of the few people who really understands, for example, the, the market microstructure of a limit order book on the one hand and is then participating in the DeFi space on the other. I'm curious as you think about this, I mean, you're talking about this is an entirely new model uh, for trading potentially any asset under the sun. How do you think that might actually shake out to have liquidity pools instead of limit order books? That's a big mental shift uh, for people who have been in finance for decades. It is. It is. And they also need to understand what the potential use case of this is. Um, when you have a liquidity pool, remember that anybody can start a liquidity pool. I can start a liquidity pool. You could start a liquidity pool. I don't have to wait for Uniswap to start it and bless it as well, too. And you can have several thousand, if not tens of thousands of liquidity pools. This opens the world to a lot of tokens that we can see trading in the future. So I've said to my friends, currently in the current world, you have various forms of money. You've got the bills in your pocket. You've got your money in the bank. Uh, you've got some loans as well, too, which might be a form of money. But you've got airline miles. You've got reward points from your credit card. You've got loyalty points from your retailer. And if you look at all of those, those are tokens, your airline miles, your reward points, your loyalty points uh, as well, too. And if you look at the way that they're structured, they're not very liquid. They're not very um, uh, cost effective. They are, they're better to have them than to not, but that's about all you could say. But in this world, you can tokenize almost anything and put it up on an AMM and trade it so that my, to use my example, my airline miles or my loyalty points, I could trade them. I could trade them on an AMM. And when I trade them on an AMM, I could convert them into other tokens to do other things with them um, as well too. Companies can start thinking about putting tokens into their capital structure. No longer do you just have bonds and stocks, but you could have a whole degree of tokens in the middle as well too, to help tokenize either revenue streams or um, intellectual property or certain divisions as well too, to give you a lot more flexibility within that structure. And then you can have them trade <coughs> on an AMM as well too. And tokens can open up to companies things that, th that they don't have right now. And I'll give you one example that hit with me. If you look at an Apple or a Tesla, one of the things that they have is that the most uh, many of the buyers of Teslas own the stock. Many of the buyers are heavy users of Apple own the stock. So the customer becomes a, a, a walking commercial for the company and they're participating in the upside of the company by owning the stock. Now go look at a Dollar Tree or go look at a, a McDonald's. Most of the people that, that buy the products of Dollar Tree or McDonald's don't own the stock. And that's because in the traditional CFI world, it's hard for those people to own the stock. What do they get out of it? It's gotten easier because of the Robin Hoods of the world in the last couple of years, but most of the times it has not. How about a McDonald's introducing a token? 
How about them introducing a token where it gives you some, some benefits to shopping at McDonald's or maybe um, discounts on some of the meals as well too, and participating with the company that as they do better, you do better in some form. Maybe it's revenue, maybe it's other forms as well too. And bring that into, I shop at Dollar Tree or I shop at McDonald's and I get this benefit from this token. And if the company does well, it goes up in value. And in a digital world, maybe it's only 50 or $100 because that's all they've got. But you've now created a customer loyalty that only a Tesla or an Apple seems to have right now. So open your mind. Oh, man, there's a whole lot of new ideas that we could do that you just can't pull off in the centralized financial world. Yeah. I'm fascinated by the world of tokens. We can come back to that in just a second. But I want to give a little bit more depth uh, for people who are listening to what we were just talking about before with liquidity pools uh, and automated market makers, AMMs, just to give them a little bit of a sense of the mechanics for this, how it functions, and how you understand it. For me, the key to understanding a liquidity pool uh, is that it's all about smart contracts. It's about the ability to program uh, different assets in a way that they can be locked in the system. That's what makes it distinct for me uh, for some of the other trading pool technologies that we have. Tell us a little bit about how you understand how liquidity pools actually function at the mechanical level for people who may be coming to us uh, from a trading background who just don't understand this big conceptual leap. Yeah, so <clears throat> you're right that the, the smart contract is at the center of it as well too. So you start a liquidity pool, you know, and everything is a pair. It's a currency pair, right? So it's not just because in the in the crypto world, if I want to buy ETH, what am I buying it with? I have to buy it with another cryptocurrency, whether it's a stable coin or Bitcoin or, or Uniswap coin or some other coin, uh, I have to buy it with that. Right. So I think of it for most people as it's either a cross pair swap. Uh, or it's a dollar-based stable coin or a dollar-denominated stable coin. That's the way that I think many people would think of it. Right. And in fact, uh, the, the, uh, the dollar-based stable coins are about two-thirds-ish or so of the volume that you see in cryptocurrencies because they're, they're volatile enough as it is. You don't want to be doing a pair against two very volatile instruments because then the, 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 the rate is going to be very volatile. So at least anchor one end of it. So tether against uh, ETH, I think is the is the largest one in the in the Ethereum universe as right. well too. So you then go into you have these liquidity pools. If I own some tether in ETH, I could I could put it into the liquidity pool and earn an interest rate as the trading goes on in the liquidity pool. If I need to trade one from the other, I have some tether and I want to buy ETH. Yeah, you can do it on Coinbase in a traditional order market book, or I can go to an automatic market maker like a Uniswap, and I could basically take my tether and put it into the pool and take out of the pool uh, ETH. Uh, what is the rate? The smart contract will run the rate. The pool has is supposed to always have equal um, value in tether and ETH. So as I take out more ETH, its value goes up and Tether's value goes down or vice versa, and it keeps the pool in balance. It's a way to do it without a traditional bid and offer, which is the way we've done it for hundreds of years. It's an amazing, it's an amazing leap in and of itself that we've seen these automatic market makers and these liquidity pools come because you could go back to the Tulip uh, mania of 1636, and we were still trading that stuff pretty much the same way we trade it now with bids and offers and market makers standing in the middle, matching the two and taking their pound of flesh for the effort. And so for 400 years, we haven't changed it. And the automatic market makers are now removing the market maker out of the middle. And that when I put my money into a pool or you trade with the pool, the smart contract will divvy up that 0.3 if you use unit swaps fee without there being a big market maker in the middle taking his money. So it makes it a lot more efficient. And the ability to let anybody start a pool, you know, not anybody can list on the New York Stock Exchange. You have to go get permission from the New York Stock Exchange in order to list. And they have all these listing requirements. Anyone can start a pool um, in, in some of these market makers. 
And that just opens up the creativity and possibilities. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. I mean, I didn't want to get into, you know, pulling out my whiteboard and drawing <laughs> curves and, and math equations and stuff like that. I'm not qualified to do that anyway. But it is it is so interesting. And to me, sort of the key enabling technology for this is the ability to constantly keep these pools in balance, right? So if you think about historically, you mentioned the New York Stock Exchange, you know, the 1960s paperwork crisis uh, on uh, the New York Stock Exchange, you have these challenges uh, with clearing and settling these trades. Well, that can happen effectively. Uh, programmatically uh, on a liquidity pool. So you have the ability to constantly keep them in balance. Uh, and in terms of providing liquidity, I think this is something that people uh, from the traditional uh, market space can understand is in some ways uh, roughly equivalent or metaphorically equivalent uh, to being a liquidity taker versus a liquidity maker. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, you're right. In the 60s, the paperwork crunch got so bad in the New York Stock Exchange, they had to close on Wednesdays um, right. in order to just basically process the paperwork, and you could actually, there's a lot of parallels that I see in, in the uh, traditional financial world to the, uh, you know, to the DeFi world as well, too. Uh, the version of the paperwork crisis might be the high gas fees that you see right now, because the Ethereum network is running pretty much at 100% capacity. And so you've got to use the level of gas fees or transactions costs, if you're not in this phase space, in order to regulate the limited amount of processing that you have. Well, there's layer two scaling solutions and sharding and ETH 2.0 coming that should alleviate those problems, hopefully in the next year. And the good thing about the, the DeFi world is they're hitting these limits now, they're fixing these limits now while it's still within their universe. You know, you don't want to bring this uh, universe out to the real world and people have to pay for critical things and important stuff and oh but now the gas fees you know it's going to cost you $25 to you know pay for a latte or something like that well right. you, you don't want that to happen there better it happen here in this space you know get the scaling solutions up get the new versions up where you can run a million two million transactions a second and then you'll be ready to start to take on the traditional financial world and say we've got a better alternative and we've tested it and it works yeah. This is so fascinating to me. And, and the reason I find this conversation so valuable, as I've said before, you know, there are people who understand the history of the New York uh, Stock Exchange paperwork crisis, and there are people who understand how Ethereum works, but there are very few people who get both and who can understand and explain uh, how these worlds potentially come together or just at least explain one in the context of the other because they are so divided right now. Let me throw another one out there for you, Jim. Uh, help us understand, in your view, what DAOs are, how they work, and what the potential significance of these decentralized autonomous organizations are. Yeah, um, DAOs, I think, are a really interesting thing um, in that they're, what they're winding up doing here is they make the regulators have to really think tough. Because if you run a DEX, or not a DEX, but a DeFi uh, protocol correctly, you've got two things that you've got. You've got no on off switch if it's run properly it's not centralized in any way and you've got no real owner so a regulator um, or a government can't come up and say turn that off there's no off switch all right we're going to go to the bus and we're going to tell the bus to turn it off well, there is no real boss because in a decentralized autonomous organization you usually have a governance coin you have an improvement proposal and in that improvement proposal um, you can propose various changes um, to it as well, too. In the case of things like Ethereum, you've got very influential voices like Vitalik Buterin. When he suggests that they do something, everybody listens to him because of his influence. And that's correct in that respect as well. But he doesn't own it. He doesn't have his finger on a switch and says, OK, we're going to go do this or we're going to go do that uh, as well, too. And so in a DAO, you've got the you know, Charlie Munger once said, you know, you 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 tell me the mo incentives and I'll tell you the motivations as well, too. Well, you've got the incentives that everybody that is in this has an incentive to make it work. So if I'm in a DAO, if I'm in a protocol and own its governance tokens, I want to do what's best for it in the long term because I make my living off of it. And I don't want it to go away. So when improvement proposals come, 
I will vote those proposed proposals and what I think is the best. And there will be influential voices, whether it's a hated Adams and Uniswap or a Vitalik um, or on down the line that will suggest various things in various ways that they should go. And their, their voice will carry a lot of weight. And therefore you can wind up having changes in the way that you run things. So what the centralized financial world has to understand is this is a very different model than the traditional ownership model that we're used to right now. Um, and that's where people tend to make a lot of their money in their traditional ownership model. In a lot of ways, I think that these DAOs, just like if I was to go back to the CFI world, a SPAC, a special purpose acquisition vehicle, have come along is because people have looked at the, the growth of a company from concept to startup all the way to um, initial public offering as a system of privilege. I need to know certain people in certain, uh, and I need to have certain connections to be able to get into something early, to get into something properly. So late stage venture capital became very, very profitable. Everybody wanted in. You don't know the guys at Sequoia or Dreesen Horowitz, you can't get in. SPACs came about and they become a way to try and mimic uh, late stage um, um, uh, venture capital as well. Not to mention just the IPO offering or IPO process that I, I need to be buddies with the guys at Goldman Sachs to get an allocation, whoever is running uh, the lead book as well too. DAOs are kind of the same thing in that I can get into a company early on without being a qualified investor, having to give my money to a VC as well too. So it, it opens it up and it democratizes everything. And by giving it that decentralized, no one person runs it type of thing, it gives it a sense of independence that a lot of companies don't have. And that could be much to the chagrin of a lot of regulators when they step into this space and say that they want to try and dictate rules on it. Yeah, you know, this is really a couple of the real key points here, I think, about the space uh, that are so crucial uh, to understand it today and also get a sense of the trajectory going forward. Obviously, you know, many of these uh, these um, these rules that are in place now uh, that basically Pre, uh, require you to have access uh, or relationships in order to benefit from this were intended originally uh, to protect investors. We can go back to the 38, 39, uh, when many of these laws came about. Uh, but in fact, what we see happening is precisely the opposite of its intention, which is that it is continuing to skew wealth distribution in the United States to the people who have those relationships, the people who are buddies with a guy at this or that investment bank or know someone uh, at this or that VC shop and are able to get on these deals. The potential here uh, is to truly democratize uh, some of these, some of these uh, early stage investments, potentially some of the gains. But with that comes uh, a great deal of risk, the risk of people being taken advantage of. I'm curious about how you think that something like this might begin to play out. If you think about the, the complex legal, regulatory, uh, and compliance infrastructure in the United <laughs> States that you're so familiar with, how, does, how, do, how do legislators, uh, how do courts, uh, how do regulators begin to get their head around what this new world looks like? You know, um, they're going to they're have a difficult time. In a moment of um, honesty, a couple of weeks ago, Randy Quarles, the vice chairman of the Federal Reserve for Supervision, said at a speaking at a conference, the Federal Reserve doesn't get DeFi. OK, at least you said you said the quiet thing out loud. And that's fine. Now you can go about the process of getting it uh, right. instead of pretending that you don't you get it when you don't. Uh, you know, um, last week, uh, Fed Governor uh, Chris Waller said, I don't know what problem decentralized finance is trying to solve. Well, I'll tell you what the problem is, and this gets to that democratization thing. Right. There's 1.7 billion people in the world that don't have a bank account. The average fee for a bank account worldwide, this was in The Economist a couple of weeks ago, is $379. Mm. Uh, you and I probably paying more than $379 for our bank accounts and for our privileges in the CFI world. And there's people in other countries that have traditional bank accounts are probably paying less. That is a tremendous sum of money. And that's why so many people have been locked out of this. So the first thing I'd say to the regulators is you try and get your head around this. Understand that in the rest of the world, they don't have customer protections. They don't even have bank accounts. Something like this 
a DeFi world, a lending and borrowing protocol, a way to save your, put your money into um, a, a wallet is a tremendous increase in their standard of living and in their ability to do basic business. The other thing I'd have to say to Americans right there, let me stop right there and say, also, if you haven't had the privilege of going to a third world country, I've been to a couple on vacation and on business a little bit as well too, I not a lot, but the first thing you should also understand is that most of those people in those third world countries have one of these. This is my iPhone and it's connected to a cell phone service. And most likely, most of those people in third world countries have better service than you do in New York City. Uh, the U.S. ranks 30th, 40th in the world in terms of, um, you know, upload and download speeds. So when you talk to a lot of Americans, wow, people in the third world, you know, they're just pushing you know, uh, plows behind oxen. Yeah, they might be, but they have a phone in their pocket and that's how they, they communicate with everybody. Yeah. And it's got an LTE connection that's just as fast as yours in New York City. And they know how to download apps. And there's over 1 billion mobile money accounts in the third world for those that actually have CFI type of, um, uh, of accounts. Right. They are the ones that want it. And the last statistic I'll give you on this is if you look at some of the surveys, they're surveys, so take them, for what they are, asking people in various countries, um, do you own cryptos or do you intend to own cryptos? This, the countries that go the highest on the survey are third world countries. Nigeria, Venezuela, Pakistan are up at the top of the list, near the bottom of the list. Japan, Germany, France, the United States as well too. So understand when you start looking at these regulations, and you start looking at what we've written for these regulations. Are you trying to protect this CFI world? Is that what you're trying to do with regulations? Are you trying to protect consumers? But be careful with that right. because there's billions of people over here in the rest of the world that are moving full speed into this space. Cardano has been doing a lot of this stuff um, in Africa with, uh, with what they've been doing uh, with their protocol as well too. And they're moving full speed and they're not going to stop. And it is a vast improvement for them. So I'd like to say to the regulators, you got, you got two choices. You can let the rest of the world define, design the new financial system with us or without us. And if it's without us, they'll find some other expert to help them, say the Chinese. And so be careful with trying to push Americans out of this system because you will do us a giant disservice. It's not going to stop it. It's not going to change it. It'll make it more difficult. It, you know, it will matter on the margin, but it can't end it. Last thing I'll mention to you is don't forget, Nigeria was number one on that list. Technically, cryptos are banned in that country. China, we all think about China's dominance in, in CFI. Technically, they're banned in that country uh, as well, too. But those bans are really not effective in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. That's all spot on. I think there's so many great points there. Uh, and for people who may be wondering, how are these countries ahead of the United States? It's this weird leapfrogging effect when there isn't existing infrastructure in place. Uh, for example, uh, landlines, traditional banking systems, it, the ability to spin up uh, the alternatives becomes so much quicker. So if you don't have landlines, uh, the speed at which you're able to roll out cell phone towers is much greater because there's no legacy competition. Uh, and so that's one of the the weird sort of uh, paradoxical effects of why uh, developing nations in some ways are able to dramatically outpace the speed of developed nations in these infrastructure rollouts, which is a, which is a fascinating notion uh, in itself. You know, look, we, we live in a world now with some- hey, Ash, can I, can I under, underscore yeah. one thing about that? You saw that in the United States, it went back 15 or 20 years ago. In the third world, you're right. In the US, 100% of the buildings have a copper line going into it so you can get a landline into them. Uh, and in and in the third world, they never had that. So when mobile phones came and they said, look, we could put up a dozen towers and give everybody in this city, Lagos, Nigeria, um, uh, access to a phone, it became a necessity. But here, at the same time, they thought it was a necessity. We thought it was a luxury. We viewed early on in the 80s and 90s, we viewed cell phones as the luxury of the rich, where they right. saw it as a necessity for the masses. And right. that's why they leapfrogged us in the, their thinking. Now we've changed our thinking, but we were very late to the game in changing our thinking with that. And that's why it's really important for people to understand 
that in these third world countries, they've got the infrastructure tool in their hand right now. And if you give them a, a decentralized financial application to use and to trade and to transfer money, they're ready to go. Yeah. So they, you know, and the, the other thing that they lack in those countries is a, a, a trusted centralized bank. That's why so many people don't have bank accounts, but they do have cell phones. Yeah. And, you know, one of the use cases for this that I think is uh, is so compelling is uh, is the remittances use case. You know, there are some data out there uh, that shows fees for remittances. These are people who are working uh, as guest workers in a foreign country and transferring money back home to family. Uh, eight, 10 percent fees. Uh, that may not sound like a lot. Actually, it does sound like a tremendous amount to me. But for people who think it doesn't sound like a lot, I mean, you're talking about people who are literally laboring under the sun uh, one month Per out of 12 uh, for free to pay their bank. I mean, it's it's morally appalling uh, in addition to being this, uh, you know, this kind of Jeff Bezos notion of uh, your margin is my opportunity. Right. You know, and to <clears throat> throw out an example of this and the frustration is uh, Western Union developed the first uh, wire to wire money in 1871. And there was an image going along around on the internet, which I tweeted out a couple of weeks ago, of an 1873 handwritten wire transfer for $300. Cost was three, it was $309 to send $300, 3%, and it would take two to four days. Fast forward 150 years later, it still costs 3% to send money. It takes a couple of days in the United States. Absolutely no improvement in 150 years. It's outrageous that there's been no improvement in that. Yeah, yeah, you can own a bank account and your bank will do it for you, but that's provided you have a bank account with yeah. minimums and you've paid them thousands of dollars in fees. Okay, now you could send that money. But most of these people that are poor, they don't have that opportunity. And this centralized financial world just has not evolved. And that's where the DeFi world can really step in. But you're right. I think payments is a big, big thing uh, in terms of trying to get this world moving in, you know, get, helping to improve everybody's standard of living. And you said it so well, one month a year, you're working in those fields just to pay your bank. If CFI can give you that month back by cutting your payment fees down to zero, that is a tremendous improvement in your lifestyle and your wealth uh, right there alone. Yeah. A few months ago, I watched this magnificent documentary about runners, uh, marathon long distance runners in Kenya and Ethiopia, and they were showing some of the remote camps that these guys train in. You go, you get you know, isolated, you focus on running, uh, and they were carrying buckets of water in one hand, and they had their cell phone in the other. Right. I mean, it is just an extraordinary story about infrastructure. And I think really just about human potential, about the ability when you give people the tools, when you give people the ability uh, to connect the really incredible things that they can do. Jim, let me ask you a question, a, a conversation uh, I had. Um, this is going back a couple of weeks with uh, with some very smart people in the markets space, probably people that you know, in fact. And they both uh, told me some version of the following. And it, look, their argument went something like this. Y yes, you're absolutely correct about the technology, Ash. I believe you. It's going to do all of these incredible things. But why do we need these damn tokens? I don't understand it. I don't get it. I know people like you who are really into the space, Ash. You talk about the decentralized revolution. I don't get it. I don't understand it. The cost of transferring money is going to drop. Technology is going to do that. But it's going to be Bank of America that does it. It's going to be Chase that does it. It's not going to be these decentralized protocols. How do you respond to that argument? Well, first of all, in order to get the cost savings and the efficiencies that you want, the history of technology has been to remove the middleman. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so whether it's e-commerce or it's blogs with the newspapers and the editor being removed on down the line, that's where you get all of the efficiencies. Then once you've removed the middleman and you've opened up the system, you get the tremendous creativity. A Hayden Adams would never be able to do what he's done with Uniswap if he had worked at JP Morgan. I mean, it would have taken it would have taken a thousand compliance people and lawyers alone just to approve what he was trying to do uh, as well. So you allow all of that creativity uh, to come down uh, the pike. So that's the reason why decentralization matters as much, because if you're going to have a big organization in the middle, let's go back to the remittances. 
It's $540 billion a year is paid for people that want to send money to other people. Half a trillion dollars goes to the banking system. If you can decentralize that, you've taken that half a trillion dollars out and you can share it among the people that are being doing the remittances as well. So that's why the, 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 the organizations, at least at those levels, have to be removed. Now, let me say, not everything in CFI can be defined. Um, you know, uncollateralized lending is going to be a big challenge. A mortgage, um, an unsecured loan is going to be a big challenge. There's still space for the traditional financial world in that, but the bread and butter businesses of borrowing and lending and deposit taking and money transfers and trading uh, and, and plain vanilla insurance, and a lot of that stuff can be decentralized and automated and made a lot more efficient. As far as the tokens go, tokens represent value. And what you're doing by tokenizing everything is you're unlocking value in a lot of this stuff. As I've said to my friends, why is there a trillion dollars in mergers a year? Because everybody thinks that companies, the traditional stock bond capital structure is inefficient and that there's some value in a company, either, either intellectual property or goodwill or something else uh, that you can unlock by doing a merger in these companies. Well, we can get rid of those inefficiencies with tokens. Tokens can allow anything that has value. My credit score, your credit score could be tokenized. And maybe I could sell it to somebody who needs credit uh, as well, too. Think about some of these type of different type of things just on a conceptual level as well, too. It's, it represents value uh, as well. Uh, so, And then you've got unique value you know, an NFT, a non-fungible token, so that <clears throat> the picture behind me, if it has value, I can attach an NFT to it. And while it hangs on my wall, because I own the original, I could see what its value is in the marketplace because there's an NFT that is attached to it. So you are unlocking a lot of value as well too. Because remember, why do we have a trillion dollars of, of mergers and acquisitions a year worldwide? Because the, the current system is inefficient and that the tokenization will allow that efficiency so that we could realize a lot of that value. And a lot of people are going to find they have stuff that is valuable. It's almost like there's always going to be a continuous yard sale where everything that I have, everything that I own, I can, I can assign a value to it that will help to increase my net worth and my standard of living. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, I agree with that. I like playing devil's advocate because there are so many people uh, who are trying to understand this, who are well-meaning. And in many ways, uh, people who have the most experience and the most understanding of the traditional finance space have the hardest time getting their head around what these new models look like. Can, can I answer that question? Um, I work for my own firm, Bianco Research, and I am an independent type of person. Maybe if I was a partner at Goldman Sachs, I'd have a different view because those traditional financial people, as I said to them, you're in the best CFI world and you've got the reserve currency. You've won. Let's be blunt about this. You've won, you're there and you're being paid very, very well. All of this stuff we're talking about takes away from you and it gives to everybody else. You've got two choices. You can either try and fight it or try and not understand it, or you can recognize that it's coming. I mean, you could, use the taxi analogy, you know, when the taxi drivers, they won, they had the regulated taxi business that charged the confiscatory fees that made it very difficult for the, uh, for the rider to do things. And the taxi drivers could do one of two things. They could either work with Uber, which they elected not to, or they could flip the Uber cars over and light them on fire, which some of the taxi drivers tried to do. And in the traditional financial world, don't do that. Don't think that you're going to just flip DeFi over and light it on fire. And that's going to be the way that you're going to try and fight back on it. But I understand why they're having a hard time with it. It's a threat for them. It's because their world doesn't really benefit from it because they're at the top of the heap. And I mean, let's be blunt about this. That's why it's so hard. So when people say it's an age thing, I, I don't think it's so much an age thing. I think they got the the causation wrong, it's how invested in the traditional financial world are you? If you're at the top of the heap making a lot of money in the traditional financial world, you don't wanna know about this. You don't want it to, to succeed. 
But if you're on the outside looking in, and a lot of younger people are, you're all for this new financial system. It gives you opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. Spot on. There are so many younger people uh, out there looking in. And I would add, uh, in the same way, the same thing is true uh, of the financial news space as well. That's you know why I'm uh, here at Real Vision and uh, potentially not at uh, one of those uh, large networks that I used to work at. You know, I, I read I read a statistic. This goes back to around February, that the Wall Street Journal had four references to the word DeFi in the previous year. Four. Now they've had some more in the in the last few months, and it is frustrating in the traditional financial world because. Th- If you only read the Wall Street Journal and if you watch financial television, and they're all guilty of it, you're left with the idea that there's three coins. There's Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Dogecoin. And you're just betting on whether or not the raindrop's going to go up the hill or down the hill. And that's that's all there is. And in a lot of the people that want to learn about this, they're they're stunned when they get there. You know, okay, I I I opened a Coinbase account or I opened a Gemini account, I bought some Ethereum. Where's this yield farming thing? Uh, well, you got to kind of move off into an unregulated wallet. What's an unregulated wallet? Never heard of it. And once their eyes are opened up and they connect their protocols, as I like to say, they have their holy shit moment. Wow. I can see this isn't ready now for the real world, but I could see where it's going right. and I could see where it's going to be. And that's uh, that's the holy shit moment that a lot of people have. But if you're reading this traditional financial pages, or watching traditional finance, they're not telling you about any of this. Have you ever heard the words Ave or Uniswap ever mentioned on CNBC, Bloomberg, or Fox Business, even though they might be on the cutting edge of what's coming next? I don't think they've ever been mentioned, uh, maybe once or twice. You know, I don't watch every second of them. I've never heard it, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that brings us uh, to the conclusion here. We've had a very sort of broad and wide and deep conversation. Tell us a little bit uh, about how you would like to leave this conversation for people who have learned a great deal, I think, about the union of these two spaces, about some of the potential opportunities here. What are your final thoughts? It's early. It's going to continue to boom and bust. There will be dark days and there will be bright days ahead. It's going to take you some time to learn it. So get started now and kind of follow along. I, I Hopefully, like me, you'll find this, this world exciting and fascinating and interesting. Um, you know, I make time during the day to read more about it, watch more YouTube videos from uh, creators about this space to try and understand where it's going. There's going to be a change in the financial space. Don't be afraid of it. Once you start to understand what's happening here, you will see opportunities for yourself. If you wall yourself off and say, no, 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 it will become very scary. The last thing I'll do is I'll quote a friend of mine up at Northwestern University, Dr. Bob Gordon, an economist up there, and he's done a lot of work on technology. And what he's found is that technology is a net creator of jobs. So when the spreadsheet was invented, you oh, that's the end of the accounting clerk, but we, ent- we created a new category called financial manager. When Uber was created, 12,000 taxi drive- driver jobs were at risk. 60,000 people are now doing rideshare. This will be a net creator of jobs. It's easy to understand the jobs it will eliminate. But as you understand the space, you will find there's whole new industries that have yet to be created. And you can be part of that as well, too. So, you know, don't be afraid of it. It's still early days. It's not happening next week or next year, but it's also not going to take you a three-day course to learn it. So start getting into this space and getting your head around it. Start off small and work larger. You know, consider it an education fee if you want, if you want to buy some of these coins. Buy them in small amounts and just start to for the purpose of learning, not for the purpose of making a quick buck. Yeah, so many important points there, important caveats. Obviously, there's a tremendous amount of volatility. Obviously, it's still incredibly early in the space. Uh, but Jim, you and I both agree on, I think, the most important aspect of this, which is the most important thing for you to invest uh, is your time in understanding what this world looks like and understanding where the future <coughs> is headed. You know, I always tell people when they ask me, about my investments in this space, because it's so early, I'd like to say, uh, and I know I've seen Ralph say the same thing too, 
uh, I invest excess money in this space so that if I wake up tomorrow and the whole space went to zero, my lifestyle doesn't change. Uh, you know, I'm embarrassed. I don't like it, but it doesn't change uh, as well, too, because it's too early to be going right. all in on this. And so even if you start with a few hundred dollars, just call it, like I said, call it an education fee. I'm not here to make money. I'm here to understand. Once you're done with that process, it, the ideas will form in your mind. OK, maybe I want to do a few thousand dollars. Now I know what to do with it, uh, as opposed to just making a blind guess is what you would be doing right away. Start a few hundred dollars. You make a mistake. It's no big deal. You'll survive. And so that's the kind of the way that you want to start thinking about uh, entering this space. Yeah, education, absolutely crucial. Jim Bianco, Bianco Research, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Enjoyed it. Thanks for watching, everyone.